fun because you were very kind on that one too. <laughs> Go ahead. It's it's hard to be harsh on any of your stuff. I mean, uh, it's hard, it, and it really is. I'm not just fanboying or because you know I consider you a friend that I'm. Uh, every book is the best. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's some that obviously I, you know, I do have my favorites of yours, and it, it is hard to pick a, a favorite. But I know the Light Beyond really, really struck a, a lot of chords with me. I mean, it definitely told a very harsh and sad story, and I found that. Again, that POV shift um, and the point of view shift really worked well. Um, and and I know, you know, going back to, to Mother, I found it gave it a real cinematic approach too. I mean, for, for people listening right now watching this that are probably wondering, well, what's this all about too? So if you don't mind me giving a quick nutshell version of it. No, please do. Um, you know, I love that it, it opens up literally, it's almost like a camera that swoops down on the scene of these you know, but a dozen students and their um, their their gym teacher, they're going across a field in a in a search line looking for a missing girl, and they find a cave opening instead. And um, in a nutshell, they basically get trapped in this cave, and of course, they have no choice but to continue on into the cavern and, and trying to find their way out. And unfortunately, they find their way very much uh, immersed in this cave and the horrors that they find in there, which is mother, which is a, I guess sort of telekinetic gelatinous blob thing that's trying to consume all the life forms or, around her or, or it um, in order to, I guess, humanize enough that to get enough functionality that mother can escape the cave and, and kind of go off, I guess, on whatever happens to be mother's agenda. And of course, it's amazing all the relationship of these kids that are there that are forced to you know, essentially be the slaves to mother's agenda where their only option is to uh, fornicate, pop, you know, um, increase their population and feed off of these fish from this pond that must go somewhere because it continues to populate. It's always got the supply of fish, which I guess is a blessing and, and a curse for these poor kids that don't have anything else to, to do about that. <clears throat> and I love... Um, and to tie that in with with their change in narration, it's really cool the way that, again, it's very cinematic where it's almost like you've got this high level overview of this camera that kind of gets in and, and pans in and gets you know right inside of Kevin's head, the, the the main character as he's writing the journal and all the happenings and the horrors and and everything else. Um, the one thing I like too is that you really focus on the evolution of these of all these kids. And then, of course, again, not to spoil it, but it really goes beyond, you know, as they start to, to make babies and to have babies and the complications and to the relationships. And, of course, how the heck do you safely birth a child? Obviously, healthcare is not there. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got these teens that eventually are there long enough to become adults, but they their youth gets very quickly and their innocence gets very quickly shattered. Um, the evolution of these kids, did you find that a lot of it kind of, you know, as a father of teens yourself and now young adults yourself, um, minus some of the more horrific events, at least God, I sure hope so. Uh, did you find that you used that you had a lot of that kind of in mind as far as the evolution of watching your children grow up to become adults to the sort of evolution as horrific as it was with the children in your, in, in mother? Oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, of course, so much of the maturation of the kids and mother is, you know, sexual. Um, so fortunately, I've not actually seen that aspect of, of kids, but uh, not only my kids, but, you know, I've taught, I've, it's, it's weird to say, but I've taught generations of kids now. Um, former students have <laughs> gone on and gotten married and had their own kids. And, uh, you know, two of my kids have kids. So it's it's been something to watch. Um, as you know, they do grow into that and then they have the children and see how they respond to it. Uh, I use some of that, but of course it was very limited because they are a very small society. I mean, they start off just 13 and then of course one of yeah. those drops off almost immediately. And then one of them changes a lot and isn't really part of their society. just kind of outside the society. So they, they, you know, they didn't have Facebook to talk about their little family and all that. Plus, I mean, it starts in 1978. So that, yeah. that was kind of a challenge too, was, you know, okay, it's 1978. So how would they originally be dressed? 
uh, what would be important to kids in 1978. Uh, I kind of went back to my past on that one. They were older than I was in 78. But, yeah, I'm, I'm, I remember the 70s a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it was it was interesting to think about, okay, they are teenagers, but how would they grow in such a small, limited environment? And I, I think they began to care for each other quite a bit when orig- when they originally went in. You know, they all knew each other, but they weren't necessarily friends. Uh, 